Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the SETI talk today. I'm glad to have you all here. Uh, I'm here to introduce our speaker, uh, Ross Beyer. Ross was educated at the University of Illinois and then received his PhD from the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. Uh, from there, he came here and he's been at NASA Ames and the SETI Institute ever since. Uh, his research focuses a lot on uh, constructing terrain models uh, from images taken from orbit. He's done that at Mars and he's done that, that at the Moon. And he's also doing it for Pluto and Charon. And he's here today about Charon, Pluto's fascinating moon. So let's welcome Ross Beyer. Thank you, Matt. All right, so I always get a little nervous when people clap before I've had a chance to talk. It feels like it uh, puts a lot of pressure on me. So today we're going to talk about Charon, the small companion of Pluto. My colleague Jeff Moore came to this forum and, and spoke about what we've learned at Pluto in the last 10 months. And today I'm going to tell you about Pluto's companion, Charon. Now, <clears throat> I like to go back to the beginning, of course. And the beginning is with this man. This is James Christie, circa 1978. You can tell by the shirt, maybe, in the haircut. Um, and this is Jim holding up the photographic plate, because in 1978 we still used photographic plates to try and do things in astronomy. Uh, and he's pointing at the discovery slide where he discovered Charon with, right? So here is uh, that image. And you can, of course, all tell, obviously, how he discovered Charon. Well, maybe that's why Jim Christie discovered it and you all didn't. But <coughs> on the left is an image of Pluto. Uh, and on the right is an image of Pluto and Charon, so I kind of gave it away. So a lot of times astronomers do photo negatives, and so on the left here is, is just Pluto, and this, say that this is bright, but of course it's photo negative, so it's dark, bear with me. So on the left is just Pluto by itself, and of course the telescopes that we had in 1978 didn't resolve, couldn't resolve the disk of Pluto, right? And so you get kind of this blob of brightness from Pluto. What Jim noticed on the image on the left is that the blob of Pluto was kind of Long, and it really, we thought it was pretty round. It was, you know, most planets, we, we, if we could see this far, it should be round. And he thought that Pluto, that Pluto was kind of long, and so he took a lot more observations and determined that, let's see if I can point with my pointer, oh no, that's my next slide. Um, so, you know, Pluto is somewhere here in the middle, and in this slide, Sharon is up here, all right? And they took lots of observations, and the blob kind of moved around, and that allowed them to predict that there was another object that was actually orbiting Pluto, even with this rough uh, uh, observational information. And of course, uh, when, you get to do, when you discover a new object, uh, the discoverer has, um, doesn't get to just name it whatever, although they have a strong influence on what to call the object. And so Jim wanted to try and name this new object after his beautiful wife, Charlene. Um, but of course, you, it was Probably he knew that he wasn't going to be able to be able to call it Charlene. It was going to be tough. It was going to be a tough sell to the International uh, Astronomical Union. And so, uh, you know, Jim's wife's name was Charlene, and she had a nickname. She went by Char. Um, there we go, Char. Uh, and so he did a lot of searching around, and of course came across Sharon or Karen, the uh, boatman of the dead that accompanies Pluto. Seemed like a good fit, and so. Um, they proposed that it be named Sharon. Now, of course, that may sound strange to you, because, of course, if you have a classical education, you want to pronounce that C-H as a chi, right, and as charon, right, and lots of people do. But uh, in the Terry Sciences, we, we try and honor Jim's discovery, and so we try and pronounce it Sharon with the soft S-H, uh, which is what he wanted. So <clears throat> for a long time, uh, that was the view of the Pluto systems, Pluto and Sharon. And in uh, just a few years ago, I don't know if Mark Showalter is, is in the audience, um, but Mark and others discovered that Pluto were not just a binary system. They were, in fact, uh, surrounded by a couple of other objects, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. But this view, this is the best view that we could get from the ground, the best view that we could get from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and uh, that's really all that we knew about Sharon uh, until 10 months ago. All right. So here on out, everything I'm going to tell you, we learned in the last 10 months. Um, so the images we took, of course, just pretty much around 24 hours, around closest approach, and we spent the last 10 months trying to figure all of that out. 
Um, so here is uh, an approach movie. You're going to see uh, Pluto and Sharon there, just as a little bit of light. The date's down here, 528, about a year ago. This was, uh, and we closest approach was on Bastille Day, July 14. Um, see the zoom guy there on the left. These little, little picture globes show you which way things are facing. Uh, and I'll just kind of play this movie forward. And you can see Sharon rotating around Pluto. You can see Pluto rotating. Um, and we're still here, 620, 623. Finally, a little more than fuzzy. And finally, um, on the day before closest approach, it got a lot better and easier to see. But um, all of that is, is all we got. So we were basically riding through the Pluto system on a rail, so to speak. We didn't get to choose to go into orbit or to slow down. Uh, and this is a visualization made by uh, our friend at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where they visualized what we did after we did it, <laughs> which is handy. Uh, you can see the Pluto system there is the ring. Uh, this is a spacecraft. This is New Horizons. That's what it looks like. Um, I want to, there's a strategic point where I need to pause it. Uh, you can see the RTG is labeled there. That's where we get our power from. As we come around, you'll see our instruments labeled here. This is the business end, so to speak, of our spacecraft. Um, and I'm going to tell you briefly that there are lots of instruments here. Primarily the ones I'm going to talk to you about are LORI, the Long Range Reconnaissance uh, Imager, the high resolution black and white camera. And uh, this instrument over here, called RALPH, has an instrument on it called MVIC, which is, uh, provides color information. Um, and so this visualization kind of shows you how the reason why we're kind of on a rail through the Pluto system is because we left the Earth with so much kinetic energy that we, you know, that little spacecraft is about as big as a, as a, like a grand piano, right, fit easily on this stage. Uh, not enough fuel to slow down. So we were moving through here. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the trajectory with the little knots on it is our trajectory. Uh, here we are looking at the sun as we kind of pan around the Pluto system. Uh, that lollipop shape looking thing is uh, the field of view of one of the instruments to show you which way the spacecraft is at this particular time. I'm going to try and scrub ahead here to show you just a brief. This is about, um, this is Pluto, right? And the, the, the white tail there is uh, meant to represent Pluto's shadow. And when we're far away, our high resolution photographs are like this. Pluto is inside our frame and we can take a picture and we get Pluto and a bunch of space, right? Um, as we go further on in the mission, uh, closer and closer to the Pluto system, right, our field of view gets smaller, and it wanders around, and we make these mosaics, right? You can see we had a couple there. We're going to hit that one. We're going to go over. Now, you'll see, you wonder, why did we take this picture of space over here on the corner? And that's because we didn't know where Pluto was exactly going to be. We had some very good missions. And so all of the sequences that you're seeing the spacecraft do, of course, it did. It was pre-programmed, and, uh, and, and uh, it ran its program when it was there made sure we had enough margin so we wouldn't miss Pluto. That would have been very disappointing. Um, but this is the, 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 the sequence with which, and the way that we did things um, as we, again, flew through the Pluto system. OK, so that is Pluto. Now, <clears throat> now I'm going to stop talking about Pluto, because that's not what you're here for. You're here for Sharon. Yeah, I know, not great. So let's, let's kind of walk through all of the various images that we have of Sharon as we approach it. Um, again, at pretty far away, it's just kind of Rorschach tests of blobs. Um, about here, you start to see features that you think you can see from frame to frame. Uh, as we get closer, of course, it gets even better. Uh, and that is the encounter hemisphere. That is the hemisphere that we saw the best. And we have individual frames and images tighter um, on this portion of Sharon. Um, here's a, a similar view. I've labeled some things. All of our names are informal. Um, they haven't yet been uh, submitted or uh, blessed by the International Astronomical Union. Uh, we're putting together that proposal sometime this year. Hopefully they will be. I've only labeled a few things here because I'm going to talk about them and, and some others. Um, so right away when you look at Sharon, um, well, maybe you don't. What we did when we looked at it, it was different. We didn't expect it to look like this. We kind of expected Sharon to be kind of maybe like the moon, a heavily cratered object whose surface wasn't all that exciting. Uh, but we, uh, we had a very pleasant surprise. So uh, Sharon is fascinating. <laughs> so up there at the North Pole, that big dark blotch that we've named Mordor Macula, Macula is just uh, the Latin for dark spot, um, <clears throat> is up there at the North Pole. And all 
throughout most of the northern hemisphere here, uh, up to about this area here where Serenity Chasma is listed, uh, are a bunch of fractures and faults. You can see cliffs, you can see what we call graben, which are steep-sided depressions. And then south of that area is this area which we've termed Vulcan Planum, which is interesting in its own right. Uh, I'm going to be talking about all of these things today. Oh, and the other thing, of course, is Vulcan Planum is, is a little smoother. It doesn't have the same tectonic expression as the, the northern area does. Um, but it does have these really interesting mountains that are isolated and that poke up and have an interesting relationship to the terrain around them. Um, just an extension of this, uh, this tectonic belt, you can see on the limb there, Argo Chasma, and that was one of our first indications of just the magnitude of what we were dealing with, uh, because we can kind of see through that notch of Argo Chasma to space beyond. It allowed us to measure, um, actually within a few hours of this image coming down, that that, that chasma is about five kilometers deep. There's a lot of uh, elevation variation on Sharon, and here is a uh, visualization of a terrain model that we made. So even though we were moving through the system on a rail, we were able to take a picture far away and then a lot closer at a different vantage point, which allowed us to do what's called stereo reconstruction and to build a rough 3D model of the surface of Sharon that we could see. And as you can see, this has about 10 kilometers of, of total relief from the highest points to the deepest canyons um, and uh, is a, a fascinating little place. I may not have a laser pointer, that's all right. Um, <clears throat> you can see that there are, uh, that these um, canyons and graben that form the boundary between Oz Terra, this northern tectonic zone, and, and Vulcan Plum here to the south are high. And they have some canyons that you can easily see, like this guy over here, Serenity, very steep sides, might look like the Grand Canyon. Uh, there are other depressions on Sharon which are not quite so obvious. Um, this guy right here is called, we've called Mandjet Chasma, uh, and it's super deep, right? It's like five kilometers below the average. But if you looked at it on the previous slide, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's kind of there. It doesn't have steep sides. Um, it doesn't have sharp variations, and neither does this guy uh, or this thing, super deep, right near the North Pole. The other thing that you can see about Sharon is that on both of these terrains, um, the craters are, are kind of about the same. So you can see craters of a certain size here along Welcome Planum and craters of about the same size sprinkled around the rest of the area. One of the things that we do with bodies in the solar system is attempt to count their craters. It's a way of getting a rough estimate of their ages, their relative ages of different surfaces, right? It's like leaving a sheet of paper out in the rain. The more raindrops that are on top, the longer it's been out in the rain. And so initially people were wondering if maybe this area, uh, this Vulcan Planum area had fewer craters that was younger than this northern area, but it doesn't. Uh, within the error bars of our ability to determine it, uh, both of these uh, exposed surfaces have the same, same crater age. That means that whatever happened on Sharon happened a long time ago and then stopped. And Sharon has mostly been quiet for the history of the solar system. And so what I'm going to tell you today is a story of what happened on Sharon, or what we think happened on Sharon, um, and uh, then what happened after that. So, of course, the other interesting thing about Sharon is that it is primarily an icy body. Um, the spectroscopy of the surface indicates that all of this is pretty much water ice. It's a couple of different ice um, varieties, uh, as, as minor constituents. But it's primarily water ice. Uh, and primarily, water ice is what forms the bones of Sharon. It's what builds the mountains. It's where all this surface is made out of. The other thing about Sharon that you will notice is that, or maybe you won't because I'm going to tell it to you, um, is that all of these features that we see are external in nature. They indicate a surface or a crust that is pulled apart. As you know, on the Earth, we have plate tectonics, and where plates come, a, come apart, we get trenches, and where plates come together, we get mountains. Right? And so on a planet that had a balance between extension and contraction, um, like the Earth does, you have a, a balance in this, this amount of landforms. But all of the landforms that we see on Sharon are extensional. We don't see any normal faults where a, a piece comes up against another. Everything is an extension on Sharon. And so that's always interesting and fun. So <clears throat> what that means is that at some point in Sharon's history, it got bigger, right? So if you blow up a balloon and you cover it with paper mache and then you pump it up some more, it'll crack, right? And you'll get extension all over that surface. So how do you do that on a 
giant uh, icy satellite? Uh, and the answer, uh, we think, is that it has to do with the fact that it's made of water, right? Freeze rock, it gets smaller. But when you freeze liquid water, it expands. So what we think happened on Charon is that um, at some point in its formation, it's composed, it's got a rocky core, it's got an ice or water uh, exterior, and then it had a global ocean underneath it, just like the Earth has kind of magma mantle. Uh, Charon has a global ocean underneath its surface. And at some point, the relic heat of formation eventually kind of cooled. And when that happened, the shell thickened up and cracked and got bigger just by a little bit. And that's what we're seeing on the surface. Um, these are uh, s uh, views that I showed you before. These, uh, uh, the labels at the bottom show the central longitude um, of Sharon in each of these photos. Uh, this is, of course, the encounter hemisphere down here. And you can see that Argo Chasma on the border. You can see it come across here. So if we go backward in time, there it is. And there it is. And there it is. Hard to see in this projection, but it, I guarantee you that it's gone by here. You can't see it, partially because the resolution has gotten worse and because the lighting has changed a little bit in that earlier photograph. But what we can tell from these images of the backside, if you will, of Sharon, is that we can see other bright, dark um, features that so the sun, is, the sun is kind of shining at about this point in all of these images. Uh, and so this indicates that these are probably Sharon, and that these features here on the back side of Sharon are probably similar to these big cliffs that are on the front side of Sharon. And so um, our assumption is that um, the tectonics and the extensional features that we see so well on the encounter hemisphere do, in fact, extend around to the back side, and all of Sharon is, in fact, in extension. So to tell you more about what we see, uh, we've kind of categorized Sharon into these four roughly longitudinal zones. Now, it's important to note, uh, kind of looking down uh, at the North Pole here. And so the equator is only here. And we can really only see down to about 30 south, right? The southern hemisphere is, is obscured to us. It's in darkness due to the geometry of the system. Um, and so there are these four regions. There's the smooth plains here in the south. There's scarps and cosmata, um, or you know, cliffs and canyons. Um, uh, scarps and crustal blocks here, and then depressions and ridges at the North Pole. I'm going to step you through all of those. So this is a map view, if we take those images and we splay them out, of Vulcan Planum. Again, there are these uh, cliffs that border Vulcan Planum, um, the last edge of the tectonic zone. And then this surface, minus the craters, is really pretty smooth, right? Um, there are these wrinkles or these, uh, these depressions, these are canyons, not ridges, I apologize. Uh, little, little troughs or rills, very similar to rills that we see on the lunar surface. Uh, and we see other little um, features that, for all the world, look like very smooth shapes. Um, and of course, our, our mountain here, this is Kukmans. A uh, bigger mountain is over here, it's off this image, uh, and this image of these mountains. Um, and the interesting thing, of course, is that if we didn't know that this surface was most ice, um, any geologist would look at this and tell you, oh, this looks like a lava plain, right? It's pretty smooth. You know, maybe these features are, are lava features where lava moves into channels or drains off. Maybe, maybe this area is where maybe lava pooled down or, or came up. It's hard to tell. Uh, but this looks a lot like a lava plain. Um, but the problem is that this is made of ice. Now, the interesting thing is that we see features like this in the solar system where, for all the world, they look like lava features, but the surface is made of ice. Now, the problem that, I have, that we have with that is that we don't really know how ice can act like a viscous fluid in the same way that silicic lava does. Um, and what you'll see if you read the literature is uh, references to something called cryovulcanism, which is basically you know, what it sounds like. It's volcanism with water, um, and where ice and water behave like lava and cooled lava rock. The problem is, is that we you know, don't have a very good natural experiment for that here on the Earth. Our pressures and temperatures are high enough that when water and ice move and flow, they express as rivers or glaciers. And that's not really the same thing that we're seeing here. That's not what this morphology tells us. Uh, but if we're right that water and ice can act like a lava, then uh, this is the same thing that we see on other icy satellites in the solar system. Now, the other interesting thing, of course, are these mountains on Sharon. 
Um, I flipped it around so you're kind of looking down from the North Pole just because I thought that made more sense for these two images. So this is, uh, these aren't map projected or, or, or anything. These are just straight out of our camera, how they would look if you were sitting on New Horizons yourself. Uh, this image was taken earlier and this image was taken later. Uh, this guy right here is Kubrick Mons, the same guy right here. This big thing back here is one that we've called Butler Mons, and this is actually our best photo of it, sadly. But when we got closer and took this picture, it was, had set below the horizon here, and only the very tippy top was still illuminated in sunlight. Um, and these are all the mountains of Sharon. The other set of mountains we see uh, in the south are these. These are uh, Clark Mons. And the interesting thing about these mountains is that they are isolated, um, which is always strange. One is used to seeing mountains in a mountain chain or perhaps in some way that they've been constructed. You see in relation when they are volcanoes, perhaps, and that certainly was one of our initial ideas is that perhaps these guys were much like the Hawaiian Islands, uh, that they were maybe over some sort of lava, cryolava hotspot, and you erupted an ice volcano that sat on top of the surface and made the surface bend down, and that's why they're in a moat, right? There, you can see there's this little kind of depression around them. Um, but of course, it turns out that you can do the math um, on an ice cell and how much flusher it should have if you pile a bunch of ice on top of it. Um, and when we did these uh, evaluations, we had a good topography. So this mountain is about five kilometers tall, and the kind of moat around it is about kilometer-ish deep. Um, and it would imply a very, very, very thin surface, super flexy, which we didn't think was very realistic. So the other option, of course, is again, if this surface behaves like lava does, if you have a pre-existing block that for whatever reason is just sticking up, and you have a lava flow or a cryolava flow come by, come up against it, that lava flow doesn't flow like water. It's very viscous. Right? So when it meets an obstacle, it kind of does this. It bows up against it. And that's what would create a, a moat around it. So that was one of our, that's still our, our best hypothesis for why that this is happening and why this looks the way it does. If we look over at Clark Montes, which is uh, this cluster of a couple of little hills, it seems to be surrounded by this kind of rounded edge in a more larger area. And again, this supports the idea that, um, you know, you had some sort of cryolava surface that came along and, and it, it, you know, there's a, a slight upwarp in the local topography and it kind of ground out and created this kind of neural edge. And you can see that this pattern ground outside is different from inside. Um, and so there's, there's lots of work that's being done on what the surface of Vulcan Planum is uh, and what the physics are that are happening here. I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, papers and, and PhD theses that will go on and tell us all about that. As we move north into our tectonic areas, we'll move into the Scarps and Kasmata. Oh, but before I go, I did want to mention, so this is um, Serenity Chasma that I pointed out before. And uh, here, where I'm kind of sketching with my laser pointer, is still Vulcan Planum. It's that southern smooth part. And here, against the border uh, of these cliffs, you can see a couple of interesting things, I hope. Uh, you can see that there are kind of weird wrinkly patterns. And again, we think that's typical of a viscous surface that kind of is piling up against itself as it comes to a halt against a, a surface. And much like, uh, well, I'll go back and show you the terrain. So much like that surface kind of piles around the mountains, uh, you may also be able to see that there's a bit of blue here around the border where this kind of uh, planes are high. And then as they get to the edge here, there's a bit of a depression, right? Kind of a moat itself right around those cliffs that edge it. Um, so that's, again, more evidence that we think that this was some sort of surface that was in place. Now, the scarps, of course, uh, and the canyons are, are fascinatingly interesting. Um, I do a lot of work with layers and, and tectonics and chasma, and uh, so it was super fun to see something that looked a lot like uh, what we would see maybe in the Grand Canyon or uh, on Mars and Valles Marineris uh, on Sharon. So this point here, uh, with regard to the floor, is about five kilometers from there to there. Um, we see um, uh, lots of smaller faults kind of in this back surface here. And we see things over here. These are fault ramps, very indicative of extensional tectonics. Um, and we also see rounded lobes here. And there's kind of one there that's hard for you to see, perhaps. Uh, and here, those are landslides. 
or ice slides or whatever they are on Sharon. Um, and so we get an impression that this crust was ripped apart and then perhaps at some time some mass flowed down and created these, these low and slide toes. Um, lots of tectonics here. Uh, this little guy here is a crater chain, we think. Craters went two, 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 two as they came down, like a machine gun. And we can compare the size of Serenity Chasma to other canyons in the solar system on icy satellites. So uh, Ariel here has, a, has Graben on it. They're about that size. Uh, Arden Chasma on Miranda uh, is about that big. Of course, here's Serenity. This one on an icy satellite is Thicca Chasma on Tethys. Um, Serenity Chasma is about the same size as these other guys, uh, and it is about only about half as big as the one on Ithaca Chasma uh, on Tethys. So it's not out of bounds. It's not a crazy thing to find on an icy satellite. So that was good. It makes us feel like we understood what was going on. Now, one of the things, as I said, um, when you have an ice layer over an ocean uh, or a liquid layer, you have a break in that ice via, via fault, like on the sides of this chasma. Right? The ice kind of rebounds up. It flexes back. And how much it flexes back is based on how thick that ice layer is, right? If it's super thick, it's not going to move much. You're just going to look like a regular. If it's very thin, then it'll kind of flex back a lot. Um, and of course, lots of people have done lots of math on that uh, on the Earth uh, and verified it. And so what we did is we did uh, topographic transits across Serenity Chasma. Uh, and uh, this is from Francis Nimmo and his student uh, Jack Conrad uh, at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and they measured this back slope, right, to see, to try and determine whether, what the elastic thickness is of that surface. And they came up with a number of kilometers, which is pretty thin, okay? So if flexure like that is happening here, then this must be two and a half kilometers, okay? Bear with me. So I'm going to show you an equation. Don't get scared. There will be no test. Uh, but what we can do is uh, also figure out what the maximum amount of on a fault like that, OK? Uh, and we use this equation from Jackson and White. I won't bother you with what it is. We plug in the numbers from what we've measured from Serenity Kappa. We put in this elastic lithosphere thickness of 2.5 kilometers. And the uh, maximum stress we get out is 16 megapascals, which equates to a depth of 6 kilometers. So the thing that's weird is that this brittle thickness, which is this number, 6 is way bigger than this elastic thickness, which is this number. So that's a problem because it shouldn't be different. <laughs> um, and so what this tells us, of course, is that um, it's probably not rift flank uplift, okay? And that the elastic here may have been this thick when Serenity Chasma formed, but it certainly isn't today. So the, that is another puzzle that tells us there was once perhaps an ocean liquid layer underneath that ice that is now frozen and thickened uh, a, a lot more. All right, let me get past this equation. No one wants to see it. You want to see more topography. Uh, so here's Serenity Chasma. We were just looking at that, right? And as we move northwards, again, we see more uh, of these um, sinuous kind of channels, although they're kind of flat floor. Again, we think they're extensional. Um, uh, there are all these little faults here. And as we move north, you see these kind of bigger surrounded by kind of deep depressions. Um, we actually think that this little high spot may have been an outlier of Vulcan Planum. Whatever filled it in may have come through a little channel here and, and filled up this area. This surface, trust me, looks different from these guys. Um, but again, we see these big blocks. So the character of the um, tectonics has changed as we come north. There are fewer of these big, long, linear chasms. Uh, although there is still one here. This is Nostromo. We gave everything fun names. Hopefully, they'll let us keep our fun names. Um, but these indicate that these are big blocks of crust. Again, that as that crust stretched as the ocean was freezing, here they broke up. These blocks remained intact uh, while pieces dropped down in between them as it kind of settled. Um, and as we move up to the North Pole, this is a looking down from the North Pole view. Um, here's, there's that Vader crater for. Uh, and those blocks that we were just looking at. I changed the scale so you can see stuff differently. Um, and here is that dark spot uh, at the pole, Mordor Macula. Um, there was some thought maybe that it was dark 
because it was a depression and it was kind of um, getting things that way or, or was collecting things that way. And there certainly is a ridge here along the edge of it where the uh, brightness changes. But the floor here of mortar macula is higher or, and softly grades out into this other stuff. So this probably wasn't a crater on its own. Certainly, that's a crater. And certainly, that's um, But um, it's not itself a large crater at the pole. Um, and uh, surrounded by this very deep chasm. And here, as we get to the North Pole, the surface is really, really broken up. So here's again are some images. Uh, again, not map projected or, or anything. This is just as you would see if you were riding on the spacecraft. Uh, and same thing, this is an image that we took first, and then this is the image we took later. The same crater is marked in both. There's uh, the edge of Mordor Macula, uh, that little pointing at the super deep, weird trench. Again, it's very smooth sides. Hard to really know that it's super deep unless you can measure it well. Uh, and again, here at this north limb, you can see that this is very broken up, right? This isn't a smooth, round billiard ball. This has got some, some edge to it. Uh, and as we get closer, here's those little blebs that are there, these little dark beads. We don't know what those are at all. Um, right? If this, if this was an object that had an atmosphere, uh, I might be able to convince you that these were dunes, but there, there's no atmosphere here, so uh, we don't know what they are. Uh, they may be just um, concentrations of whatever this dark stuff is that got out. I don't know. Like I said, we've only had this data for 10 months. Um, but what you can see on these uh, cliffs here um, is that there are these ridges. I'm trying to draw with my laser pointer. And they have, I hope you can see, have kind of a dark layer at the top and then maybe some stuff that's falling down. Uh, and we know that that's really a different color. It's really darker because these cliffs are actually facing the direction of the sun. So it's not a shadow. Uh, and so there's lots of interesting things going on on Sharon. And it's a crying shame that these are the only photos that we have. Um, and so what we can do once we uh, have all of these images together is that we can create a map. So this is a map that my colleague Stuart Robbins at the Southwest Research Institute made. He uh, sat down and he uh, drew all, looked around and drew all of the features that he could find, all of the canyons and the chasma and the scarps and everything. Uh, and I know you can't see that super well, but trust me, there are little lines all over this map that trace out the, 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 the uh, edges and the patterns of all of the different tectonic features that we can see on Sharon. Uh, and what you want to know is, is there any kind orientation to all of these patterns. And so we took all of these things and we broke them down into these four categories. So Graben, which cited flat floor depressions, uh, including Serenity Chasma. That's like a really big Graben, but this is a smaller one. This is Tardis Chasma, by the way. Um, there, uh, there are also grooves. So these are uh, don't have a flat floor, but are depressions, right? Uh, ridges, like this guy, uh, and scarps, which are just high on one side, and then there's up, and then they're low on their side. What you're seeing here are, uh, there's a line for, and they're um, normalized, so you can't see the caps. So they're normalized, so the longer the line is, the more features there are that point in that direction, right? And so what this tells us is that for the most part, uh, the tectonic features are not super well aligned in any individual or singular pattern. There's a general alignment of westish, west -ish, um, kind of pointing up to um, the northeast uh, and the southwest. Uh, and the interesting thing is that we know that when, um, what the reason why you do this is to try and understand something about how the surface cracked or something about some of the physical processes that were happening on that object. So um, we know that if a body just cracked from just from um, expansion of its icy shell, that those cracks are going to be isotropic. They're going to be pointing in all kinds of directions. They're not going to be pattern. Um, so these seem to be in some kind of weak pattern. So maybe it's not just that. Other things that affect the direction uh, like this on a planetary scale of cracks and fractures are heterogeneities in the ice shell itself. So, you know, when we make these models, we say, oh, they should be isotropic, of course spherical cow of completely pure water ice that has no, no imperfections. So it's certainly possible that things in the ice shell itself could cause uh, differences in the stresses and, and cause patterns in uh, the tectonics. Uh, the other possibility is uh, something called 
uh, true polar one. So if you have an object that for whatever reason reorientates where its north pole is pointing, uh, since it's in a gravity uh, dance with um, the, that the effect of changing the direction of which way its pole is pointing can also apply stresses to the bottom. Um, and the, the upshot is, is that all of those things could be happening, but we can't really tell if any one of them is happening uh, to the extent of the others. So that's still work that is very much in progress. Um, so I will uh, finish up here early because, you know, no one knows about a short talk. Um, and give you the, the kind of the take homes of things that we talked about today. So, <clears throat> one is that uh, on this little wonderful icy satellite of that extension dominates Sharon. Every tectonic feature that we see is being opened up and pulled apart. Uh, and we think that's about 1% of expansion, about 35 kilometers of shell thickening. That doesn't mean that you're getting 35 kilometers taller, it just means that you're kind of freezing down and freezing up a little bit, but it's thickening of that shell. Um, we think that uh, this area of Vulcan Planum here in the south is resurfaced by cryovulcanism, um, that the water ice was acting like lava and doing those kinds of things. Uh, and we believe that all of these things that happened happened really long ago. The crater counts tell us that even this resurfacing, if we think this happened after this cracking, still happened billions of years ago, the beginning of the solar system, and it's been pretty quiet except for the craters hitting the surface since then. Uh, and finally, the fault orientation implications uh, don't tell us anything conclusively today. Um, but again, in 10 months, got to give us a little more time. Um, and that is what we have learned in 10 months from Sharon. Thank you very much. And of course, there's All lots right. of time for questions. Lots of time for questions. I'd like to start by asking a question. Um, you said to that uh, all things on Charon have about the same amount of craters, which would indicate that you had all of this geological activity happening early, and since then it's just been sitting there and receiving craters. Right. Um, to my fairly untrained eye, as I look even at that picture right there, it mm -hmm. looks to me like Vulcan Planum actually had more craters, or maybe it's just that it has better defined craters. Is that an image quality thing or a viewing geometry thing, or is that real? So um, that is an observational bias. Uh, and it has to do with the way that the sun is shining. So the sun, the subsolar point, right, where you would, where would you stand on Sharon at this time where the sun is overhead is right about there, okay? So that means that things far away from the sun are getting lots of fun shadows, and you can really easily see the craters. But all this stuff up here, the sun is right overhead, and so you're not seeing any of the shadowing from terrain or features, so it's hard to pick out. Fair enough. That makes sense. Okay. I'll uh, please uh, wait until I bring the microphone since we are being recorded. Uh, <clears throat> could you describe those uh, two instruments, Laurie and Ralph, uh, and how they uh, how they were used? Uh, sure. So uh, Laurie and Ralph. So Laurie is a, a black and white CCD camera. It's a big telescope made out of uh, carbon fiber. Uh, Jeff Van Cleve here in the audience can tell you a lot more about MVIC since he helped design it. Um, so the Lori instrument is our primary black and white uh, camera, high resolution. Um, the MVIC <coughs> uh, instrument is a, a multi has four color bands and, a, and also a pan uh, band as well. Uh, and it uh, builds up its image. It's a push broom imager, so it has uh, strips of different colored uh, detect uh, filters on top of the detector, right, Jeff? Uh, and so you build up an image by sweeping it across your target, and you get all the colors. Uh, Lori is a frame camera, so it's a big square, just like the camera uh, in your phone or in your uh, in your backpack. Uh, but of course, bigger and way more expensive. Is that <laughs> was there other features about the cameras you wanted to know about? Okay. Well, you can ask me more questions if you come up with some. So looking at the surface there, and trying to imagine if this is four billion years old surface since it was last resurfaced. I might have expected more craters. Is that because maybe the density of objects to hit it is less as you get farther in the solar system? Yeah, so um, I'm not a, a, a crater expert, um, but um, that is certainly the case, right? So you don't have much gravitational focusing from Jupiter and the inner planets that you get a lot uh, more denser stuff. Although it is interesting, right? You could certainly, certainly we did expect 
a lot more craters. This is actually pretty smooth. You can actually find pretty good areas of what we call intercrater planes. Um, and so we don't know if that has to do with uh, you know, the nature of the Pluto. And certainly, again, uh, people who are more conversant with crater uh, uh, studies and dynamics of things in the solar system have a lot of work to do. And to try and, they have some explaining to do, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's it, is that it's a little farther away and it's not getting as much gravitational focusing. Yeah. Or wait, wherever the microphone um, is. Microphone over here. Sorry. Okay. Um, so by looking at the features on the surface of Sharon, um, on the side that faces Pluto versus the side that doesn't face Pluto, um, and plus looking at its shape, if it's egg-like pointed towards Pluto or not, have we been able to tell if it solidified before tidally locked Pluto or not? So there's a couple of different questions. So I will tell you. So this encounter hemisphere, this is the uh, Pluto-facing hemisphere. I have a very good look of the anti-Sharon uh, hemisphere, or the anti-Pluto hemisphere. Um, but what we were able to tell is that we had people doing lots of what are called limfit profiles on all of the images as we came in. And even though I showed you a bunch of these variations where the edge of Sharon looks kind of sawtooth and it's crazy, that by and large is a whole is really pretty round. And so we aren't detecting any noticeable oblateness uh, for Sharon. And so its form was probably locked in pretty early before any tides or, or significant flexing from, from Pluto. And of course, it got locked in. So once it's tidally locked with Pluto, as it is now, it's not feeling any tides anymore. Right? It's, it's just where it is. Um, about what percentage of the surface were the cameras not able to image well? Okay, so um, I will answer with the slide. <laughs> uh, we'll go back and, uh, because that's always more useful. Do, 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 do. Nope, nope, too far, too far, too far. Um, that's the one. Okay, so um, as I said, everything south of 30 degrees, total darkness, not seen in any of the right? 30 degrees south is there, and it's there. Can't see anything. I was pointing away from the sun, not even lit up. Um, this is the encounter hemisphere, right? So the sub Pluto point is somewhere in there, right? Um, the anti, let's see, 350 or zero, and so the anti uh, Pluto point is there on this image. And so as we kind of go backwards in time, kind of around, and this image right here, this image reprojected to the same this, right? So um, I don't know that I can see any features here that I believe as actual features any more than a Rorschach test. Right here I can see this kind of bright crater and there. I can see. So it's, it's kind of a gradation from good to bad and then again nothing south of 30 degrees. <laughs> hey Ross, uh, good talk there. Uh, I might have missed when you came up with a hypothesis for how water can have the consistency of oatmeal. That seems like a really interesting question for much of the outer solar system. Would you offer up some speculations about how that might work? Uh, I, I, I may avoid doing so before embarrassing myself. So um, you're absolutely right that this idea of water behaving the same way that silicic lavas behave is fundamentally weird, not a way that we observe water or behaving on the Earth under the pressure and temperature conditions that we have. And indeed, the, um, I don't believe that any uh, lab experiments have been able to uh, uh, convincingly reproduce that kind of behavior either. But of course, it's always hard to do things in the lab on a small scale um, in comparison with giant forces of nature. Um, so uh, I am not going to speculate because uh, I don't know that research very well. And it's, in my opinion, has always been a bit of a sore spot to me personally because I just don't understand how it could work that way, especially since we can't seem to get a good handle on it. But the evidence really seems to be strong. It's made of ice, and it sure looks a lot like, like, like frozen lava does. So and there's no shortage of PhD theses and, and research to be done. <laughs> you could go back to the uh, global elevation map. Uh -huh. um, on the upper right, uh, the, uh, a little bit to, to the left, that yep. uh, looks perfectly round. Sure does. And then there's another ring that's partially visible there. You think like this? Yeah. What the heck? 
So um, certainly uh, in the solar system with large basins. So this is clearly a crater, no doubt about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and whether this increase in elevation around it is um, its ejecta or not is harder to determine. Certainly we do see that in other places in the solar system. It certainly could be. Um, it's not completely circular. Again, if it's really old, other things could have happened to it that may have eroded it or altered it. So the the that clearly a crater yep. um, seems to be only visible in the elevation map. Uh, it's certainly easy to see in the elevation map. Um, if you know what you're looking for and you're not, and you, I can show you the picture, you can actually see the edges of the of the uh, crater in, invisible as well. And it's not all that far from the subsolar point, so it's right. And so make it harder yeah. to pick out, but you can see it for sure. On your relative elevations, how do you figure out the uh, comparison line, the zero? Oh, what zero is? So, um, let's see, let's see. Let me decide how I want to answer this. So the answer is this complicated. Um, what we do is, uh, as I said, the initial observations that we took, we had individuals that were doing limb profiles to determine whether Sharon was round or a blade or not. Uh, and so their measurements define the average <coughs> radius of Sharon. And that's what we use when we um, uh, do the stereo solution. Now there's another, the reason why I, I hesitated for a moment is because really what we want to do is we want to take our stereo solution the way that we build it and have it independently solve <coughs> for the radius at every point and not be bound by some a priori input average. But we're not there yet in, in the work that we're doing. We hope to be there in the next year or so. So you'd sol the answer is you'd solve for it with all the data that you have. Right now, we're kind of um, uh, using a bit of a cheat to get an average. But the relative information is the same. It's just mm -hmm. kind of what the absolute is that's uh, uh, Just a few basic questions. Uh, first of all, how big is Sharon? And uh, what percentage uh, is that of uh, relative to the size of Pluto itself? It's like a double planet. That's right. And then, uh, then the third question is, um, you know, any speculations on the formation of the system? So Sharon is uh, 606 kilometers in radius. Um, and Pluto, <laughs> uh, if I quote a number, it'll be the wrong number. It's bigger. Um, <clears throat> uh, of course, I don't know, someone, someone perhaps will look it up. Um, but it is a pretty good fractional size. And if anyone knows in the audience, please shout it out. Uh, it's a good fractional size of Pluto, certainly. And that's why certainly the, um, this uh, movie that I showed you is a little disingenuous, this movie, um, because it shows Sharon uh, orbiting, come on now. Oh, now my movie isn't going to play. How about that? Fine, whatever. So um, you saw it orbiting Pluto in pretty circular. And it, you'll notice that this says Pluto-centric. In reality, of course, the center of mass of the Pluto and Charon system is somewhere outside of Pluto because of the mass difference. And so they actually both kind of, Pluto does a small circle and Charon does a big one. And so in some ways, it really is a very interesting binary system that way. Um, as far as uh, the formation of the system goes, that's not research that I do. And so uh, I could sit up here and guess something that it would probably be wrong. Um, um, uh, it's very interesting dynamically. There's Mark Sherwalter is in the back who's discovered a lot of the small objects around Sharon and Pluto and can, you, can, you can find he's in the back. Wave Mark, you can ask. He probably has a much better opinion about what happened and how it started. Uh, Ross, I got a question. Yeah. Um, 2372. Thank you, 2372 kilometers. Uh, since the flyby of the 14th of July, uh, did you use all images about Sharon or you're still waiting for some of them? It's a good question. So um, due to the way our spacecraft is built, I, I won't be able to get the right place. Um, due to the way our spacecraft is built, it has that big antenna on the back that it uses to talk with Earth, but it's not on an arm. And so as it was taking the images of the system, it wasn't pointing back to the Earth. So it recorded all of its data on its hard drive, and it's been slowly playing that data out over the last year, and still is. And so. Um, one of the things that we've done over the last year is prioritize and decide, well, we want this image. What's more important to get down earlier versus later? Uh, and so 
I can uh, assure you that that was a fun exercise to decide whose science was more important, what was more important, when do we need what when, and when was the press conference that we needed that by, um, and you know that sort of thing. Uh, and so that's a process of bringing the data down. Uh, by now, we have uh, most of the geology, certainly all of the high resolution imagery of the surfaces of Pluto and Charon at their full resolution. There are still some images um, uh, in the approach phase. Um, no, let's see. You know, some images uh, like this, uh, both for Sharon and Pluto, that we only have as lossy versions, that we expect to get the non compressed versions by the middle of this summer. And there's still a lot of like particles and fields data, other things that haven't quite come down. But most of the geology data has, is now on the ground. Uh, a question that you're going to totally love because not only is it about craters, but it's highly speculative. So <laughs> good luck with that. Could we uh, get a big picture? Picture. So you're talking about how. This guy? Yeah, that that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about how you expected more craters. That was the big story on Pluto, but also on on Charon. And mm -hmm. so, based on the crater aging thing, like we normally do for the inner solar. Um, can two questions about the craters that I, are speculative? Um, can you hypothesize, you know, the bodies using mathematics or whatever the bodies that caused those craters? How much rocky versus how icy they would have been? Um, and then the other question is the timing, uh, based on the refreezing and and whatever, and the number of craters. Um, could these craters ha be created by bodies displaced by the hypothesized ninth or tenth planet that may or may not exist in the outer solar system? Could they have led to? Because uh, I, I gather they're later than the late heavy bombardment in in origin. So, okay. Um, so, with the caveat that I am I'm not a crater expert. Um, uh, as far as the composition of the impactors, it's impossible. You, you can't tell from the impact what made it. The only thing that the impact tells you is energy that, that, that was used to create it. So, you know, it could have been some giant fluffy thing or a very small dense thing. Um, uh, but by and large, it's the, the shape of the crater is not diagnostic of what made it. There, there are some exceptions, certainly, um, but, but by and large not. Now, the second question about um, could these impacts have been formed by perturbations from some other massive object out in the Kuiper Belt. Um, again, I think that the data that we have on the surface isn't diagnostic enough to, to, to separate that. So certainly, we know that there's a population of small objects um, where Pluto is that could easily have impacted it and, and caused this without uh, the need for a larger object in the outer solar system. Um, but certainly, it's certainly also possible that if that was there, that could have caused more um, material at, at Pluto's orbit to intersect it. But the data that we, the data we have from New Horizons isn't going to be able to tell us one way or another about that. Could you compare the structural differences uh, between the surface of Sharon and Pluto? Sure. So. Um, so Sharon is what we call strength dominated. So as I said, Sharon is mostly, as I said, the bones of Sharon are made of ice, right? All the surfaces are primarily water ice, and at Sharon, that ice acts like rock. It doesn't act like ice as we know it on the surface of the Earth. Uh, and so it's strength dominated, which means that all of these features that we see are created by a material that's strong, like rock, and not weak, like sand. Um, but Pluto, of course, is a very different featured body. Um, and it has a wider variety of ice constituents um, on its surface. Um, and its features, I don't have any pictures to show because I was focused on Charon. Um, but features like the large uh, high albedo area at the anti-Sharon point, Sputnik Planum or Tombaugh Regio, um, that's made of nitrogen ices and methane ices, which are much uh, at the pressure and temperature of Pluto's surface are much uh, softer, and so they flow like a geological fluid, uh, and we get things like things that look like glaciers and flow features in a very kind of viscous medium that are not 
strength-dominated features. Now, certainly there are some strength-dominated features on Pluto, because again, uh, bones of Pluto also are made of water ice. The high mountains that you see are water ice. That's the only kind of ice that we've detected that can make tall peaks. And yet, they're also frosted by methane ices and nitrogen frosts and that sort of thing. So there's a much wider variety of surface materials available to Pluto to do interesting ge geological things. And we see that expression on, on Pluto, whereas Sharon is um, pretty much a one material surface. And spectrally, it's very boring. There's, there's only, only two features spectrally on Sharon. There's mortar macula, because it's dark, and then everything else looks spectrally identical. With regard to the terrain reconstruction technique, what's the kind of practical limit in terms of number of images you need to create that model? And then how does it respond as you get more images or better images to Im improve the accuracy of the model? Right, so um, you know, at, at, the, at the, the, the least level, you only need two images to make a stereo pair, right? Um, uh, the problem that we have with Pluto um, is that we're very limited in the observations that we had. Again, we were, we were flying on this rail through the system, and so we weren't really able to get a lot of different viewing geometries of the surface. Um, and so uh, we do have the ability to take other images and put them into the solution to try and refine things. But generally, you're going to make a train model with the best resolved image pair that you have. And then the other pieces that you will put into that solution mathematically are going to be lower resolved anyway. It helps you get a little bit better, but it doesn't improve your solution in the same way that you would on other planets where you're orbiting them. You get lots of observations, and you can really use a lot. Um, the other technique that we uh, applied to Pluto and Charon a bit, but um, not in a characteristic or, or holistic way yet, is a, a, a technique called shape from shading or photoconometry, where you use single image. Uh, and you assume that you know something about the surface, and you use it to say, oh, this is bright, this means it's facing towards the sun, this is dark, this means it's facing away from the sun, and try and derive uh, surface topography just from that. There's a lot of assumptions that go into that. It's usually best to start with a, a terrain model that's been built by stereo means, and then use shade from shading or photochronometry to kind of give you a little bit more resolution um, uh, and, and sharpen up your terrain model. So given the, that you've gotten all this great data uh, from this one mission, are there any future missions planned to either Pluto or Sharon? Uh, no, there are not any missions planned to Pluto and Sharon. Certainly the team, we've talked about it. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you the, the history. If you know, so New Horizons was um, the proposal to initiate New Horizons was submitted in 2001. Spacecraft was built and launched in 2006. It flew by Jupiter in 07 and then arrived last summer. So uh, getting out to Pluto is a long trek <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and difficult to do. So I think that we'll go out there again. It may not sadly be within my scientific lifetime. Uh, it, it's a, a, a big task. There's a lot for us to learn still, I think. I think there needs to be probably some time for us to make sure that we understand what we've got and to formulate the next mission. Proper. So the, the thing that you might want to do, of course, is visit Sharon and Pluto when they're on the other side of the solar system and their south poles are illuminated, right? Um, but you know that's going to take 125 years. So, you know, orbital mechanics is what it is. Uh, of course, New Horizons is going on to a second target. Uh, that's right. In the Kuiper Belt, a, a smaller object that's orbiting out beyond Neptune. Do you want to say anything about uh, when that encounter will be, and are you going to have a similar? role in that encounter? Yeah, so um, the New Horizons mission, um, after we got past Pluto and Charon, of course, again, we were on this rail. We had this huge momentum vector out of the solar system. But however much fuel we had left in our tanks would allow us to go kind of, you think of Pluto as the, the focus point. There's a cone out past Pluto where we could adjust our trajectory. We could go anywhere in that cone. And so prior to the encounter, there was a, a ground-based telescopic survey to try and find a small Kuiper Belt object, something out there in the cone that we could fly by afterwards. A couple of candidates were found, and one was selected. Uh, MU69, um, I'm sure it'll have a more interesting name soon, hopefully before we get there. Uh, and uh, the last, not really the last, the last, one of the major, major last acts for the spacecraft was to point itself uh, and do a burn that would uh, take us to MU69. 
uh, and we fly by in 2018. Uh, and we'll have a, a similar, very fast flight. It's a much small object, but the advantage is we'll be able to get a lot closer to it. So one of the things I didn't talk at all today about are the really interesting small moons of Sharon and Pluto, and not of Sharon, Pluto and Sharon. Um, uh, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra, they're small little icy bodies, but we couldn't get great images of them because they were really far away, and the mission was really focused on Sharon and Pluto. When we fly by MU69, we'll be able to get a lot closer to it and get a lot better resolved images and data of these small icy bodies in the outer solar system. Well, uh, this has been a very interesting exchange. Uh, we want to uh, present you with a mug as a token of our thanks for being thank here. You. And let's thank Ross Beyer once again. Thank you.